So yeah, getting this thing started, how would you describe what exactly it is that you do? You know, what is your work here in this life? Oh, that's a large question. What is my work <laughs> here in this life? Well, as trite as it may sound, my work in this life is to perform global alchemy. Okay. So. And then I do that in several different ways. Mm -hmm. So my main way is through my, as you already know, YouTube channel. And in my YouTube channel, that's where I get across esoteric content, esoteric knowledge, my own intuitive knowledge in the most in the what I would consider for social media, that's the strongest outlet that I have for my teachings. Mm -hmm. And so through there, what my goal is, what what my aim is to raise the viewers consciousness into more of a nuanced, more of a high discernment level and more into unity consciousness. Mm -hmm. So as you also may already know, we're going through <laughs> a really turbulent time right now when it comes to spiritual awakening. And so it's my absolute honor to be able to help people through a spiritual awakening because it is so because it is so obscure, because there's not a manual for it, because there's mm. so many pitfalls. In fact, I'd say there's more pitfalls than anything. And, and one of my true joys actually is being able to take these complexities, these obscurities, and especially these pitfalls, and be able to help a person through that. Mm. Wonderful. Wonderful. What more noble pursuit could there be? Right? <laughs> <laughs> so how could we explain how we go about doing that in a general sense? And I know it's not quite like that. It's quite particular to the individual. But is there a general blueprint on how to alchemize ourself to the higher self? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because that's what the art of ascension is. The art of ascension is essentially the blueprint for how to turn our base metals into gold or go into enlightenment. And so the interesting thing, though, is that with each age, there are gifts given. So we're in, we're in this age now, the spirit of this age. There's actually a really vital gift. And I would not say that that exact gift was present in the ages past. So even though the art of ascension has been well known, the art of ascension was not done through the prism. It was not done through the paradigm or the lens of raising, ascending the emotional body. And that mm -hmm. is what is key. It is, the, it is the vital force in this age. So what is the gift? I'm sorry, was, is that the, the gift? The emotional body, the, the ascension of the emotional body. Oh. So what's being performed, the alchemy that's being performed in this age, the strongest would be the awareness and the emotional intelligence of the emotional body. Mm. And I I would say that, that that gift was not present in past ages. So even though there's more or less a blueprint, but that blueprint does even change itself with each age because the energies in each age are different. Uh -huh. So what would be the assignment or the requirements for one age? we might shift out of that might longer that might no longer be relevant in the next age mm, or there might be some features of those practices of that art of ascension that do carry over and so that's what alchemy really is alchemy is the preservation of this hidden knowledge or what they call apocryphon but even though i've said all of that there's there's still in this age a new assignment or a new gift to add to that. And no matter how much I love, you know, esoteric teachings or what have you, no one would be able to say that the, the ages prior to this one were emotionally intelligent. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> they had vast wisdom, vast, but not emotional intelligence. That's interesting. So, how did the art of ascension differ from this age 
as in what were what was the blueprint for previous ages or maybe just the previous age yeah so this is actually a really larger question that i'm going to try to condense into one teaching or one storyline because by the time we get into the earth arena reality is multidimensional so what we see is even in even in really great logos who have come to remind and awaken humanity about the higher truth but even just different spiritual prophets within each age what they're doing is giving um helpful truths into this layer of reality but it is multidimensional so when when I, I have to preface what I'm about to say with that knowledge of that, this is multidimensional because I'll tell you like the strongest, like the most funneled or the most channeled um, reason, mm -hmm. keeping in mind that there's more to the story. Mm -hmm. And that's really what the teachings about um, there being 12 disciples, like anytime you hear about a 12, it was because of all the different prisms, all the different paradigms that this reality is being viewed, is being witnessed through. So I just want to make that clear before I say something as bold as like, oh, well, well what was that ancient <laughs> ascension knowledge? And so what was being taught was, was the question about what was the ascension blueprint? Yeah, so what was the art of ascension in the previous age if it wasn't about uh, emotional ascension? What was, you know, how could you ascend before the age that we're in now? Okay, so so that's why I was saying the like largest like pool coming through right now that wants to be taught is that when we've typically thought of ascension, the more that we progress in each age, the more we're actually being able to ascend higher. Mm -hmm. And this is this yeah. is not so even it like taught. builds upon each other is what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. So in past ages, we were teaching about, well, s some logos like Buddha and Christ, particularly were emotionally intelligent because <laughs> mm -hmm. it's the awakened heart center, not not Buddha but Christ is the awakened heart center, but you have Buddha also who has um, what I would consider an even higher frequency than that. Mm -hmm. So they're teaching these things, but when it comes to the actual ascension process that people were going through, it was one that was heavily focused in the mental body. And that can only take you so far, which is why with each age, the souls that want to perfect that art of ascension will find themselves incarnating back, not to do it again as though they're starting from scratch, but to learn more of that alchemical art of exalting the vibration. Because one could say even universal consciousness had discovered that there is more than one body or aspect to it. Mm. So there's the mental body, and then we have sentience, and then we have the manifested, and or what's called will. And so, when you're having when you're having teachings focused upon how strong thought is, mentalism in general, um, about enlightenment through the prism of the mental body. That's great. That's something that you can build upon even. But what we have found, and now I don't have mysticism to back me up on these things. These are, you know, like at the end of the day, <laughs> I I get information and I can't always verify it no matter how much I try mm. through mm -hmm. resources. But what was happening was that souls were ascending only so far as their fool, the, the entirety of their fractal, them being the microcosm of the macrocosm could only go so far when everything was carried out through the prism of the mental body. Is this making sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, okay. So no matter how much we ourselves identify 
with the mental body or, or even whatever aspect. There is still a level of objectiveness to this art of ascension. And what I mean by that is we still have a more entirety, no matter how much we are, we ourselves are viewing this art or the awakening process in general through one lens. So it's a, it's a discovering process. And so there's many souls who have been progressing. They've been advancing, sure. But with each age, there's different energies that open up and with that different gifts to this whole overall process. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, we're going for it really early on this one. This is uh, getting deep really fast. Yeah. I understand, though. So you could say the previous age reached its pinnacle um, of the mind, ascension through the mind. And that's where collectively we're at now. But correct me if I'm wrong, you could say that we're almost off kilter a little bit, like off balance, a little too much mind, you could say. So we need in this age, the emotional body to come and balance out the mind stuff so that we reach a sort of integration between the mind and the heart. And then that is pretty much the alchemization process. Yeah, and then that creates a third journey, shall we say, or a third leg of the journey, which is operating now through an open heart. But the energies needed to be prepped. So mm. it is, from one perspective, just a story. It's the continuation from the ages of one singular story rather than something went wrong. We weren't allowed to complete this mission in this age. That's not really what it was about, although... Within that, there are certain types of awareness or knowledge that has windows to be given. And so that's where the concept of the initiates of the flame come in, where there are certain things, a part of this alchemical process that need to be given within certain windows of civilizations, or else that window will close. Ah. And so... Yeah, it is a fun little journey, but what you have is like like the father of Gnosticism, Zarathustra, a Persian. So this is like very ancient teachings. He he was exiled essentially for how revolutionary his teachings were at that time, mm -hmm. and then even hidden, like ridiculously hidden. Um, particularly, well, all of his teachings. But anyways, the reason why I'm bringing him up is because if he, he was very strongly for women and for women's right at that time, he was preaching how women are equals. Well, at that time, mm. that was like crazy revolutionary. So do you yeah. see how this whole process of like true ascension, not like human in a certain time period <laughs> version of ascension, yeah. You see yeah. how like he was clearing the way, but that like certain energies just weren't prepped at a collective level. So there there are always very key, very important spiritual figures doing that energetic alchemy in a time period for that larger global alchemization. Yeah. Wow. So is this the time of us being able to tap into those previous masters and we essentially all have the opportunity to become the master is that what makes yeah. this age different well i mean it sounds quite privileged of me to say that to everyone when there's war in the world right now occurring so mm. to use a blanket term like for everyone i i would say yes on one hand but then on the other hand it's not evenly distributed right yeah. the resources one has for that aren't just evenly distributed yeah but should a person sh should a person really harness their willpower or 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 really try the universe always meets matches you toe to toe mm -hmm. always i see and i was telling that at one of my recent soul gatherings, because I had some audience members that I love my audience. They are so heart-centered. They're seriously so awakened. 
um, some of them were concerned about what would happen to other people that, you know, don't have the knowledge, don't have the gnosis that, that we in the spiritual community in the United States has. And that's beautiful to even be concerned that much. But the universe never, never leaves a person hanging. If a person is dirt poor and they don't have any of the resources that I or you have, the universe sees them trying for whatever that would mean for whatever their context is, they will meet them e there. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's not based off of some sort of caste or hierarchical resources or economic status. Yeah. Yep. It's like, you'll get the book that you needed for the next step, right? Mm -hmm. Just like a little carrot in front of a mule. It might not be a very comfortable journey. It might not be all the resources flooded at you at once, but how would you be able to even process that anyways? Yeah, exactly. It will always be what you need at that time to get you to the next step. And the universe, that's where mercy comes in. That mm. is true mercy. Mm -hmm. The universe would never leave someone hanging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, so, all right. On my original question, how we started this whole thing, what can we do to follow this path? You know, it, like I said, it's hard to generalize here, but would you say meditation? Um, what kind of modalities would you say? I, you know what I mean? Like how to somebody that maybe is interested, but they really don't know where to start. Where would you say somebody starts along this path to work with the universe, as you said? You know, this is really interesting because power and awakening go hand in hand. Mm. The more a person goes through a spiritual awakening, the more they want to step into their power. And I'm 100% fine if I see an example and they, that doesn't fit into this. But I, I, I've never witnessed somebody going through a spiritual awakening who doesn't want to step into their power because stepping into their power is their next step for whatever their healing is or their awakening process because they are ultimately one and the same yeah it's like that's what you wake up to yeah power your empowerment yeah that's why even when i have sessions with my clients and they're talking about whatever they're talking about I notice myself more so holding space for gentle encouragement and mirroring permission because so many people are going through a spiritual awakening, but then accidentally, very innocently stepping into their shadows simply because they don't have adequate support systems that are giving them emotional permission. Mm. Mm -hmm. So what the next step would be is something where we start really going into, once again, the assignment of this age, one of the assignments of this age which is propping up our emotional intelligence because the mind can continue to advance, but it can no longer, it will hit a wall if it does not go help and gently help exalt the emotional body. Yeah. So a lot of times people even pit the emotional body against the mental body or spirit against will. And I don't see them that way. I see how they can be at oppositions, right? We use our mind all the time to tell our feelings, how we should feel. So we we can be at war with the truth of our being versus what we want to be real. But it can also just as much be, what's that? Is that from Seneca? That one quote, the mind is a dangerous master, but a beautiful servant. Yeah. It could yeah. help serve. Yeah. Helping the emotional body untangle itself so that it can develop because that's really what enlightenment is and that's not what enlightenment was ever considered in the past because enlightenment in the past was considered samadhi mm -hmm. mm. and the funny thing about it is it is samadhi there that's not false but what i find is that 
there's different stages or levels of samadhi. Mm -hmm. And going farther and higher into samadhi doesn't necessarily mean that like, what if we already did that? Many of us already did that. Many of mm. us already mastered samadhi. Mm -hmm. mm. So what if it's taking samadhi into the emotional body and the physical body? Yeah, I think so. I think you're right. I think you nailed it with the quote. That's what it's all about. It's not all about um, becoming a complete ascetic and uh, shooing away the world in a cave. It's taking that essence of peace, stillness, the samadhi wavelength into one's work, into one's dharma, you could say. And uh, I think that's really what this incarnation is all about here. So that ultimately, what's this all about here in this in this time? I think we're creating a better world. You know, we're creating a better life for ourselves, but also collectively a better world for future generations and future incarnations. And that only comes about through being still. I feel as though one taps into their God-given skill set, you know, your knack. I believe we all have certain knacks here as a human. Um, it only comes through being still and knowing that you have that power and being able to still the mind enough to work from that stillness. It seems counterintuitive because it's like, what do you mean work from the stillness? But if you know, you know. If you know that it's, it's hard to explain because, it, like I said, it's a contradiction. But I'm pretty sure you can attest to that. Like the more peaceful, do you agree or disagree? The more peaceful that you have become on this path, the more you've healed yourself, you could say. Do you feel as though you're a better servant for not only your life, but also the collective and the world as a whole? And that just comes naturally? I think it gets tested more personally, but that's just my experience. Yeah, yeah. Because... Once again, it's pulling from so many different paradigms. So I'm just going to hone in on a paradigm that like, like a more a, a deeply esoteric one, whether it's esoteric Christianity or, or Gnosticism, there's a, a deep mission of salvation, really. And that can get super evangelical or dogmatic. And I don't mean it from that realm. But once a person has gone through so much of the alchemical process themselves, they'll start getting to the leg of the journey of the heart. Yeah. When you get to the leg of the journey of the heart now, it's either about purifying already the open heart, because there's a misconception sometimes about the heart. People have so many judgments, they can't even recognize that they already had an open heart or they came into this world already with an awakened heart. Mm. But purifying that to a certain degree that now we can start we can start transmuting collective energies. So that might not be peaceful. Mm -hmm. And that might feel more like testing because there's a lot of energies. We could look at it like in the deeper realms of this reality that some of them are coming up to be processed they have they they're looking for um they're looking for a way into oneness yeah they're turning more towards that but there's not enough of a way towards that and so what I, myself, I'll just speak for myself, but Rosicrucians knew this as well. So I'm, I'm in alignment, at least with this aspect with Rosicrucians. They know that to integrate one's doppelganger or to integrate the darker aspects of reality that I was talking about, the ones that are trying to get back into oneness, There's no, there's no mission more honorable and more important than that, in my opinion. Mm. Mm -hmm. But it's not, at least in my experience, peaceful. But I'm sure people pursuing peace will also, just like a paradox, it's not like peace is going to dead end you. You're, you're only going to, you're, you're only going to have from there 
your own journey with that. And it's just going to make you a stronger broadcast of that for your reality. So I don't dishonor peace at all. Mm hmm. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Um, I'm gonna try and articulate myself here. Uh... I mean, a person has to have some level of peace, because to me, peace is like the highest frequency. Mm. Yeah, peace and love, So when right? I think of peace, I don't think of it just when you're saying it, like it's a word that we're throwing around. I know what, how you're saying peace. I, I, I can feel how much you value that. And I also value it as much as you. So when, when I think of peace, I think of, oh, that's the highest frequency. Um, not that I want to play around at the lower, lower levels, but more so the, to attain true peace in, in my perspective would be peace in the middle of the chaos, not away from the chaos. Yeah. So, so, so that's, that's what I meant. I think we're talking about the same thing, but that's yeah. what I meant when I said it's more testing. It feels more testing. Yeah. And um, I think it has to be testing because that is the archetype. That is the blueprint for peace. It's harmony through conflict for some reason. That's just in the code of this thing we call life. And I think it's because we have to learn. Uh, and when we learn our lesson, you know, what is a test for? Like when we're in school, uh, if we pass the test, I feel as though we do gradually get more toward peace and we have to continue, you know, kind of getting ahead of myself here. Earth is like a school, right? We've all heard that. It's like Earth school. So I believe we're continually tested, even though if we do touch upon samadhi in meditation experiences, psychedelic experiences, it's not like that's the end all on the journey, on the path. I just think that is like a glimpse into a higher reality that is possible to bring about in the physical realm. And I think that's essentially what's going on here. And um, yeah, it doesn't like change up everything all at once. Um, you know, it's not like, you know, that peace is the highest frequency, then everything is peaceful. I think it's actually quite the contrary. I think the tests get more and more to test you to see if you're really about this life, you know, to test if you are really um, earnest in what, in your pursuit to, uh, to become the master, you know, to step into your power. I think it's like, personally speaking as well, the tests just get more and more intense. But yet there is that peace amongst the test, the light amongst the darkness. Um, and it's because of, it's personally speaking again, it's because of I've had the glimpse into that peace. You know, I feel as though once one sees it, gets a taste, a glimpse, even if it's just for like a second, there's something that never leaves you. You know, you could call it samadhi. You could call it bliss, satchit, ananda, whatever you really want to call it. You call it God. But for me personally, just tapping into whatever that wavelength is, the highest wavelength of pure peace, it's something that has never left my being. And I can work from that no matter what's going on in my life. Or at least I try, you know, the tests keep coming and keep coming. That's for sure. Sometimes I fail the test. I'm not a perfect being. But I feel like that essence is something that is like forever ingrained into this vessel of Gary, you know? Um, do you feel the same way? Like no matter how intense the tests are in your life, how, uh, how busy the illusion of Maya may seem in your experience, how intense it could be that no matter what, you can always come back to that sense of peace within. It's almost like a sanctuary. Absolutely. Yeah. So I actually don't even consider samadhi like a peak experience or something that happens in between life. Because what what's happening for, and words are a silly thing, but what <laughs> I consider the first wave of ascension, the first wave of ascension is learning how to operate as a, as a human in samadhi. Mm. I didn't know how to operate in some, once I had the awakening this lifetime into Samadhi, like definitely a violent and peak experience of awakening. Yeah. But then after that, I was left with Samadhi. Mm -hmm. And the new challenge became how to be a human in this state. 
Mm-hmm. It was very weird. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I get why some people, yeah, I just get why some people have come up with really interesting ways to define this reality. <laughs> I personally think they're coming from like, they don't know that they're in an intermediate intermediary realm of samadhi. <laughs> what do you so mean by they're that? Like, like, huh? What do you mean by that? Uh, what do you mean definitions of this reality? Um, so a lot of people are stuck in solipsism, but it's a very oh. innocent solipsism. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I don't think they realize that they're actually need to integrate the physical realm the uh, with their uh their awakened samadhi state because mm -hmm. it could be so confusing operating in such an expanded level of oneness that you could really go into a lot of different interesting definitions of this reality based off of solipsism mm -hmm. yeah but to answer your question about peace yes because Peace means something is resolved. And mm. without that feeling of peace, then a person will be lost in their character. They'll be lost in their stories. They'll be lost in their wounds. And those are all valid and they're important. But they're valid and important for the sense of resolution. They're not just valid and important and you should keep them. Mm. They're valid and important because they need to be acknowledged and processed, which is why I talked about the emotional body, is what this age... That's the gift of this age. It's becoming emotionally intelligent. That emotional intelligence has fruits. It shouldn't lead to more turmoil. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's gifts to things. Uh, there's re not, you know, I don't mean rewards in a really crude way, but there's, yeah. there's actual fruits mm -hmm. to that. And one of the fruits is peace. Mm. Yeah. Amen to that. Yeah. I think a big difference also is that we don't do it for the rewards, I feel. Like this whole path isn't for the fruits per se, even though you could say fruits come and go. Um, you know, the, the very piece... Buddhist of you. <laughs> I don't know. That's just how I see it. It's like um, we don't exactly do it for the fruits, but yet the fruits come. And uh, yeah. I don't know. It's just interesting. I f that's just how my personal experience. Like I do feel like it's like you don't do it for the peace, but more peace does ensue. Um, yeah. So you've never meditated for a, a fruit? I think more so in the beginning of my meditative path. You know, I, I did it like as the fruits were getting over certain mental illnesses. Like that was more of the fruit, <laughs> you know, it was like, I got to meditate so I can calm down a little bit here. And I still do that for sure. But it's more so now integrated into my lifestyle as like, I try to bring meditation into everything. Like if I'm washing the dishes or if I'm making food or if I'm doing X, Y, or Z, I, I try to bring the the mental muscle memory, if you want to call it that, of meditation into the workings and goings on of my life. And is that for the fruit? I guess, yeah, I guess you could actually say that I do it for some reason. And I guess it's just more toward peace. I don't know. It's hard to explain. I guess now you got me thinking it is always more toward fruit, but it's more toward peace because it seems like the more you do it for something, it's like, are you really gaining peace in that pursuit? I don't think so. Well, there's uh, a paradox there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because we can do something for the fruit, but not have attachment. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. I put enormous amounts of my attention, my energy, my focus, my action behind my videos or my channel. Mm -hmm. But it's not all it, it's not at all from a state of attachment to the outcome. Yeah, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Like I do not have as much energy I put into it for the fruit of my contribution to the whole mm -hmm. for the spiritual awakening taking place. I'm not attached to that outcome at all. Yeah, I think that's true freedom.
to be not attached to any outcome here to just do become and just get lost in the becoming you know get lost in the creation essentially because that's what we are we're creators if you can just create without any idea of i'm doing it for x y or z i think there's so much liberation in that right yeah i i do feel like like some things there's more flow mm -hmm. and then some things there's like i guess more we still put energy you know like like we still put a lot of energy into helping one another awaken no different than how like it's like a it's like a chain or it's it's like a spiral staircase right like i want people ahead of me to have a certain level of care and not attachment but i want them to have enough attachment let's just call it that i'm lacking a better word to care about me and so i want to provide that level to those who I am the elder sister to my brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. but with a, with a strong dose of non-attachment. Yeah. Amen. I think a true teacher does that, whether it's directly or indirectly, they say, here's what you need, but you definitely don't need me. Um, and if any teacher does say that directly or indirectly, I say run the other way because that's not really what a true guru you could say is. A true teacher or teaching is just a reminder for oneself to come back to oneself. Yeah. Well, that reminds me a lot about the Gnostic awakener, you know, Christ consciousness. So what you were talking about earlier about mm -hmm. peace. Mm-hmm. And how that never leaves you now, even when you're doing things. I would actually consider that Buddha consciousness. Mm. But Christ consciousness is the awakener energy, the heart-centered awakening energy. And so the heart-centered awakening energy is the is the one that awakens a person out of the spiritual amnesia. What's being awakened out of the spiritual amnesia? Well, ultimately for what you said, to like come back to oneself, but in the form, at least for Christ consciousness of remembering oneself. Yeah. So it's self-remembrance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, um, do you feel like there is this subtle obligation or maybe not so subtle obligation to become the awakener or at least to help guide others along this path now that you've got so far do you feel like um you kind of have to do this you know i don't feel like i have to i'm in complete alignment with it so it was a pre-birth intention so many of us many of us chose to incarnate in this time for that. Mm. Yeah. But I don't feel necessarily like I'm I'm shackled to it. I, I feel a lot of um, gratitude. Yeah. So why do you do it then? Where does this will come about for you to put yourself out there and kind of a vulnerable way, you know, and to showcase this to the world. Where would you say this will comes about from? And I know that's not the right, I didn't phrase it in the right way, like obligation, you feel shackled to this, but is there like this pull to help others in you that's just like, just burns so much in your heart that you just, you kind of have to, I can't, I don't know another way to say it, but do you know what I'm getting at? Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah, there's literally no other reason why I would need to be energetically composited into who I am. Like, I, I'm only designed for that. Or else Sarah, as we know, Sarah wouldn't need to be in the way that I was designed. Yeah. So I was not designed to uh, just go hang out. <laughs> <laughs> this life that would actually with my design 
that would make me enormously anxious and there wouldn't really be a purpose for me yeah. because everything has a purpose. Now, you know that everything has a Dharma. Yeah. So it would actually feel extraordinarily bad. Mm. Yeah. I get to, you now. To, to not be doing what I was designed. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So essentially following this path, being aligned with this kind of dharma, um, even though it might seem like a lot to the outside, it's quite the contrary. This is the most natural lifestyle for you. And if you lived and just hung out, like you said, if you just lived without being who you are, which comes from pre-birth, which you were destined to be, it would actually cause you more suffering. Enormous amount of anxiousness and yeah, yeah suffering. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. And actually, I have a video on that about anxiety. I think I said something about like the title might be like the spiritual roots of anxiety or the esoteric roots of anxiety, something like that. Because mm. a lot of people are experiencing anxiety, and there's so many different physical, physiological reasons for that. But I go into for that video specifically like the spiritual backdrop of this age and just like how we could imagine source code or matrix code as the backdrop to this reality the spiritual backdrop to this reality has to we have to know that context and if we don't we're going to feel really anxious and be going in the completely wrong direction on how to relieve that anxiety because at that yeah. point that anxiety is an existential one because it is not okay to continue to only view oneself from their character especially in the spirit of this age yeah um and that will lead to a lot of suffering as you already pointed out mm -hmm. yeah i feel that so essentially can we sum up all or most or some of our suffering and anxiety in this age the turmoil that we see comes from that in a very deep and absolute sense it comes from essentially an identity crisis of just us thinking we're just a character in that solipsism mindset of just like i'm just this character and our will comes from that we make bad decisions from that and it just like is in the cycle of some sorry you could say and we're in this cycle of that until we realize there's got to be another way until we kind of wake up out of our own our own shackled life's lifestyle and that leads us down the path of um of the spiritual backdrop yeah that was a good synopsis actually okay <laughs> just making sure <laughs> yeah because it's it kind of sounds like a monopoly talking about spirituality because we hear so many different fields especially religion talk about things through the lens of a monopoly mm. right like their paradigm is the correct paradigm yeah and that's off-putting and narcissistic but there is, at the end of the day, just a natural way that reality works. Mm -hmm. And the more a person is not awakened, and I know that that can sound, you know, new age or even though it's not new age at all, but it could sound new age. It could sound even privileged or elitist to talk about, well, you got to awaken. Mm -hmm. But really, there's no way to be happy in a very low frequency state of being, a separation consciousness, yeah. unless you're constantly having the ego's resources to maintain that. It's like the, the, the destiny of that is like a balloon that's air is going out and it's mm. designed for the air to go out because the air, because the thing that's going out is the balloon is the ego. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's like constantly, if you have the resources to keep 
pumping air into it, right? But it takes constant maintenance because it's not natural. Yeah. So the suffering is to such an extent of separation consciousness that you'd almost have to be a psychopath for you to not feel bad in mm. this type of environment. Mm -hmm. And I actually think on the other side of the coin, the darker side of the coin, it is sowing some seeds of psychopathy in the individual that doesn't yep. have any awareness of the spiritual backdrop. We're getting sort of psychopathic because we think that is the way. We think, you know, hedonism and materialism is the way. Um, but I think eventually that will also pop. That balloon will also pop. I think it's just an extreme example of it in some of our lives. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I actually hear uh, people like Jordan Peterson talk about that from a psychological standpoint. It's quite interesting how like people are becoming like mini psychopaths. So yeah, yeah, I encourage people to hear his explanation, not me. He puts it a lot more eloquent than I do, but yeah, it's like sowing very small seeds of psychopathy um, with this with the separation mindset. I can see that. Absolutely. And ultimately, the design of the military industrial complex is to make make people psychopathic. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, that's quite dark. Mm hmm. Yeah. Mm. So, the, so, so we have that going on. <laughs> yeah, we have that. And, and that's why reality is multidimensional, because people can see either one facet of reality going in a really dark direction, one facet of reality going in a really, you know, evolutionary impulse. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it's because our reality is multidimensional. Yeah. And we're in a free will universe and the free will universe accommodates more than one free will timeline. Yeah. Yep. I think that's intensifying in the period that we're in these timelines. We've all heard it before, you know, the timeline split. But I think it's like the more you know which timeline you're in, the more it intensifies. Or maybe the other way around, the more it intensifies, the more you know which camp you're in. Um, I hope that made sense. But as in like, you know, if you're in the separation mindset, it's going to be as time goes on in this age, it's going to be harder and harder to break out of it until maybe we do reach some kind of reckoning point in the future. Who knows if that comes about some kind of cataclysm or something that does pop the balloon collectively, you could say. But before the balloon pops, I feel as though it would be quite dense and quite hard to see through that. And then on the other side, the light side of the coin, the spiritual backdrop, as you said, it becomes more apparent the more that you do um, live on this wavelength and embody this wavelength in your, in your life to see through the illusion of the military industrial complex or Fox News or all of the goings on of the drama that we see. It's actually, it's like... Um, I don't know. It's like, it's just, how do I put this? Like if you're on either pole, and obviously this is just an older simplification, but I feel like if you're on either pole, either camp, it's like getting more and more intensified as we go on. Do you know what I'm getting at? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I, I, I'm, I'm agreeing with everything you're saying. As in the poles are like getting further and further apart. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. It's the mitosis. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the pulling apart of the cell, mm -hmm. the cellular division. Mm. And so that's actually what I was getting at earlier when I was talking about how, like, well, I was designed for that. Many, you know, ma many of us have already mastered samadhi. Many of us have already come into this life with a full mastery of so many things but yet you still have to start off with out your memory. Mm -hmm. But you have that spiritual memory that's with you the whole time, right? I don't know one person who I could talk about, even though I'm being vague at this level, who was really a child when they were a child, right? Mm. Mm. Yeah. So it's, it, it is this catching up. There's this catching up to something, and it's like a magnet. That it's like we don't know what we're catching up to, but we feel like we're catching up to something, and this magnet is pulling us there. Have you ever felt that way? 
yeah. in your own process. Uh huh. Yeah. I call it the pull to God. And there you, you don't go. have to say God. There's a lot of people that don't like to say that. Pull toward unity, a pull toward love. Like there's just something that is just pulling you in. And as that intensifies, like I said before, the other side I see intensifies the the aversion to that. But I can see through that. I can see through that. And ah, it's like the stronger the pull, the stronger the pull from the other side. And it's just like balancing act, it seems. That's the journey. It's this balancing act at a collective, but also in my personal life as well. It's just, it's, just, it's a, um, what's that called? A tug of war. <laughs> back and forth between the light and the dark yeah but i know what side i'm on <laughs> which we're actually all on yeah yeah <laughs> and back to the like darker energies in this reality that want to be integrated through that that that's when we can really start being that helper towards that mm -hmm. it, it's when we can hold the tension of those middle poles not because we're confused about what we are it's rather not needing to be, it's, it's basically knowing we are the light mm -hmm. rather than needing to really make a statement about I am, I am from the light because once we come too strong with one affiliation, it's naturally going to produce an aversion or a yeah. battle with the other. Yeah. It's more so just coming from that centerness of knowing we are the light we have that um, openness because the reason why I'm even saying this is because the darker energies in this reality don't have, like, it, it's almost like children who are mirroring children. Like no one's the adult. Yeah. If there's no adult, then there's just going to be the same problems, right? They might mm -hmm. get recycled, they might get remixed, but they're going to be the same problems. When a person can step into that, higher calling now the dark can get transmuted mm -hmm. and and if it's just being mirrored by the light that it's a child too and it's fighting that one then there's no adult mm, yeah yep true maturity yeah i also feel though touching upon the words of jesus unless you become like children then you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven and uh, that's the difference between being childlike, you spoke, and being childish. Well, actually, you spoke more on childish, I would say. Like, to be childish is, like, naive and, I don't know, just, you know, it's hard to explain. But childlike is more wondrous, more pure, more just at awe. You know, we all know what it feels like to be a kid. We know what a kid is like. It's just like a sort of play in that. And I think, yeah, I think dwelling in the middle is being very childlike. Um, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Because there's two of everything in this reality. Mm -hmm. And that's what my book, my first book is on. So there's always, for any concept, the shadow of that. Yeah. And so the child I was referring to in its unexalted form. Mm. Mm -hmm. But the more a person awakens, I can actually tell simply by how I can see their innocence. Mm. Yeah. Because the ego is always trying to portray itself some way. Mm -hmm. the, the ego is constantly trying to, even through a spiritual ego, the ego is trying to protect itself. From, that's why the ego can't laugh at itself. Mm. Like that, the highest level of mystics, see, see there's, there's high level mystics who can't laugh at themselves. And I still respect some of them. But the ones that are higher than that can laugh at themselves. Yeah. And that's the child. Yeah. You're not taking exactly. yourself so serious. Yep. The spiritual ego is always looking for how to protect itself from being, you know, fr from not slaying itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's still coming from a very wounded place because it can't laugh at itself. Mm -hmm. 
but the 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 child that you're talking about that's the vulnerability of essence and when you're really when you're when you're really enlightened you become childlike yeah childlike exactly oh, it's quite beautiful i feel that yeah innocence innocence all children are innocent for the most part right isn't that what we revere about children is their innocence yeah your very stream of consciousness that's innocent <laughs> yeah sounds like very flow do you do poetry um not really sometimes sometimes i write some stuff i write some stuff to music which you could call rhythm and poetry you call that rap <laughs> yeah but it's uh no i don't ever write poetry no i never really like sit down and write poems maybe i should i don't know i see like life as a poem life is the poetry yeah yeah i do revere poetry though there's something so special about it because i think a, a good poem um or art in general is what takes one out of the mind like a good poem is more than just words like it hits you in a place that is more than just logical or rational it's something moving in how the words are conveyed or how they're structured you know rumi is like the number one example if you read rumi then it'll just hit you in a place that this podcast wouldn't i don't know there's just something about poetry and like zen koans are kind of like poems as well they just hit you yeah. in a way that take you out of the mind and more just into the moment you could say more into this emotional center that we talk about so um well you get naturally poetic mm. when you because you get naturally more in tune with your creative energy that's why the zen teachings can sound poetic even without meaning to yeah yeah hmm. what is poetry how would you even describe what poetry is well i actually think everyone has the capacity for poetry and it's not the it's not the same for like rocket science right but i think everyone has the capacity for poetry because i think the human mind the human form the human experience is poetry yeah so that's why i think it's more innate to our being mm -hmm. um i think literally anyone could become a poet if they really wanted to even if i wouldn't like their work i don't need to like their work to you know like mm -hmm. poetry is something very natural it's very dharmic to the human experience yeah Whereas other arts, somebody can still be inclined towards, they can still be gifted towards, but it's not inherent within the human experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think because it has something to do with the word, There's something so special about the word and language to the human experience. I mean, you can just compare us to animals. You know, an elephant isn't going to write a poem anytime soon. Right. <laughs> so there's just something special about the word. And when you use the word in the right way, it just does something to you it does something i don't know how why there's some magic in the formulation of the word um yeah i think there's just something i don't know how to explain it like i said i'm not gonna even try to explain why but we all know we all know what a good poem does to our being it just makes you go ah oh. just like mm, yeah <laughs> yeah no it, it it's there's something there's something super divine about it because mm. when when I've seen people perform poetry, whether it's at slams or things that I've watched online from my favorite poets, it's like channeling. Yeah. It's like if I re or or something I've read that I'm like I I love so much that I'm res I'm jealous, but in a good way. Like it's not really jealousy at that point. I'm in so much like, oh my God, how did you write that so good? I want to yep. write that so good. Yeah. And when, when you're in that level of like, just awe, what I've noticed is that it's, it's like a form of tantra. It's uh, like yeah. verbal tantra. Like you could tell that it's just this union and they're channeling. Yeah. Because if you actually think it, it you could tell it didn't come from their logical mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like this came from somewhere else. Yeah, very true. Mm. That's like the first time I got into Dharmic teachings from mystics and masters of the past. I was like, there's something different about this. 
This isn't like regular philosophy that you would read. There's something very particular about, you know, the Upanishads or the Bhagavad Gita or Buddha's words or even Jesus's words. I'm like, there's, they're using English, but it's the way that they use it. And they're saying something that I've never heard before. And I just follow that. And I can recognize this so-called truth with a capital T in all of its different mediums that it comes about, all of its different vessels, whether it's audio, whether it's in a book, or whether it's like through imagery. There's just something about having a resonance to this truth that goes beyond logic and rationale. Like we said, there's, there's like a um, intuition, I guess you could say. There's some kind of intuitive discernment that comes about and ever since my spiritual awakening, I have followed that and it seems to have not led me astray so far, following some kind of internal intuition, very subtle. And uh, I think we all have it. If you follow that, you won't be led astray. You know, you could say that is the higher self, that is the Sadhguru within, but I think every single human being has the ability to do that. And it's more so like of a, some kind of like magnetic resonance that just pulls me in you know, to whatever the teaching may be. And like we said before, previously in this conversation, that teaching is bringing me in to myself. <laughs> whatever that teaching is, whatever form it comes about, it's really just good poetry, I feel, is bringing you back in to the truth of yourself. And uh, I guess that's how I would describe it. If we want to talk about this kind of poetry of the self, it just brings you back home. It's that simple. Yeah, and you touched on a really good point because all of those teachings that come from these spiritual masters sound like poetry. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And they were they were even said in ways that other people were frustrated about. Mm. Because they could not fully understand it unless they were initiated. So the the ways that truths were still conveyed and were done through like a vessel of preserving was through it kind of being like said in a way where only if you were truly wise enough with your ears to hear it, mm -hmm. could you actually decode that poetry. Yeah. So it was just poetry. And then if you were That's if you it. were human enough and and you know developed enough to really tone attune yourself with the nuance of what was being said yes you know i get i could clearly i could crystal clearly tell a person's level of consciousness by if they call my teachings word salad if they call my teachings <laughs> yeah. word salad yeah. i could tell it's the same as what we just talked about mm -hmm. it's they don't got ears to hear yeah Mm -hmm. But other people go, oh, my God, that was so profoundly, concisely simple. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That just means ears to hear. Exactly. They like the word salad. They're a fan of salad. Because <laughs> it's not word salad to them. It's word yeah. salad if, like, you're not there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you said something very good. Decode. It's like a code, yep. right? It's like a code. But if you don't have ears to hear, it's just not going to compute. It is. It's like a code. And it's interesting because it's traveled. This code has traveled from, I don't know, the beginning of time. Who knows? But it, it was like, it's like a game of telephone in a way. And that you had to be initiated into these, uh, I was going to say secret societies, but it kind of was like that. You know, these very specialized. Like inner circles. Yeah, inner circles. The secret societies has a negative connotation. But it's like, yeah, inner circles of knowing. And they initiate you if they sense the understanding of the code you know if they can sense the computation of the code and then from the initiation you have the ability to initiate others with the code and it's like this something that travels within our words but it's not the words exactly it's not it's like what what does the symbol stand for and if one can see what the symbol the symbol behind the symbol you could say stands for then you kind of are allowed in a way to continue on that transmission that came from, like I said, who knows, eons past. It's very, very peculiar. And now we have the internet where it's like, 
this code is out in the open and there's a lot of people that are parroting it and there's a lot of people not judging just observation there's a lot of people that are like trying to sound like others that have come before to transmit the code but i can sense just from some kind of vibration energetic resonance that they didn't get quite initiated like it takes a special person to be able to transmit this and uh the internet now allows a lot of people for sure to get initiated 100 percent exponentially but i also do think that it works on the opposite way there could be a lot of phonies a lot of spiritual they're actually like might be spiritual word salad <laughs> honestly um but you're not you're, you're definitely not in that camp but do you know what i mean i think that it could I know exactly what you mean yeah like there's a lot of i don't know i'm not trying to sound arrogant or judgmental here but there's a lot of people that just like mm, i don't think you should teach you know, I don't know if you're there quite <laughs> yet. <laughs> and I mean that with the utmost respect and love. But um, that's the, I guess, the double-edged sword of the internet in the times that we're in. You know, there's, with great power comes great responsibility, a wise man once said. Uncle Ben. Thanks, Uncle Ben. Uncle ben. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah, I'm for it. Um, and I, I really do feel like having everything be a free-for-all and... To me, you were just discerning. A lot of times people confuse judgment with discernment. Yeah. yeah. You're just discerning something. There wasn't a judgment behind it, but you can clearly see something. Mm -hmm. And I see that as it being like a part of this age. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that in a way to defend, you know, people who are pretending to be at a certain level that they're at. It's simply just in sometimes we think things need to be like how they were at a different age. And so one of the things, one of the cons, pros and cons of each age is what, what's the environment? What's the atmosphere? What's the things native to that age? And so with this age, it's social media. And there's mm. so many pros to that. Mm -hmm. It's actually helped advance the awakening. Yeah. Well, some of the cons to that is anybody can profess to be anything and then just do things from a narcissistic or egoic motive. And then, so I see that as one of the collateral damages within this age. Mm -hmm. And one of the other things that I see is that is um, something that Andy Warhol said, and this isn't neither here nor there, this is just an observation that Andy Warhol made, and he, he was really right. He said that in the future, everyone is gonna have their 15 minutes of fame. Wow. And now everyone, talk about an even playing field. Yeah. Everyone has their own brand or everyone has their own whatever going on. Podcast. And I don't, I'm not, I'm, I haven't assigned a value to that. I'm not saying that's bad. I just think that that's fascinating. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If anything, I see it a part of some sort of growth phase. Yeah. I see people kind of like you learn how to ride a bike by what? You have to ride a bike to know how to ride a bike. Yeah. Yeah. So if I were to assign that to anything, I'd see everybody has their own newspaper, right? In mm -hmm. the form of podcasts or, or their their own thing and even if they're not like initiated or not or even if they're they're bad prophets or bad teachers or, or they're doing everything for really base consciousness reasons the good thing about this age and then the universe is helping out is that bad teachers are getting phased out mm. yeah they're getting yep. phased out and then on top of on top of the universe phasing out teachers then what you have is this like um, enterprise, an organic enterprise. What I mean by that is people have now so many different options for everything available mm -hmm. that people organically will just not pay attention or not what, whatever to that. So, so people are giving everyone sufficient mirrors, right? We see that through karma. Mm-hmm. Karma isn't just for heinous acts, right? It's for literally everything. So everything I see, 
even you know like bad content creators or bad or you know like all those things either the universe has to intervene because the person has such a large platform and they're dangerous with their views and they're coming from an egoic space the universe will intervene and straight up phase them out yeah and then the ones where it's not that severe of a case they're getting their own karmic mirrors from from other individuals and then they're mm. gonna have to compete with the real deal and when you compete with the real deal now you leave it up to the audience yeah so there's so much stuff a part of this time that i've reflected upon that I see is one way, but then I, I see the the growth factor there. So I really just see humanity and all throughout all the ages, kind of like a, a baby that's learning how to walk and then the maturation process of a human life just from an evolutionary perspective. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see the order, right? You can see how it'll all work out in the end, right? Yeah, or how even like how some things can are necessary for the growth. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. I agree. Oh, man. Yeah. It's all about the growth. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that is uh, the big switch for all of us to see. The switch of perspective is to see how all of this is for, at the end of the day, our growth. It might not seem like it in the moment. I think we mentioned this previously. In the conversation, how there's a lot of turmoil in the world, and it might seem a little entitled for us to say that in this, but I don't know. With a keen eye, I feel as though one can see this all for our collective growth, our collective evolution to become a better species overall. Um, I believe, at least that's what I see. That's that pull that we talked about that I feel. It's this pull for all of us to ultimately, uh, create a better world, create heaven on earth. Uh, I don't know. It might seem a little grandiose and lofty, but I think that's what's going on here. You know, we're creating some kind of heaven like state, definitely not overnight. That's for sure. But eventually I do think it'll all get worked out and we'll get there. Tr the truth will prevail. You could say. Yeah. <laughs> I did a video about a year ago. Now it was on shifting to the new earth, unity uh -huh. consciousness. And in it, I talk about how enlightenment is perceived as a peak state and not a stable state. And then on top of that, enlightenment is perceived, perceived as a finality. It's a final state. Therefore, no conflict or karma arises from it. But yet, that's just because those concepts that we've created about something we're so far away from. We've put them on a pedestal and we're looking at them from our ego. Even if it's a spiritual ego, we're looking at them from an ego. Once a person gets closer to them and then can embody that, then we see that karma doesn't have to always mean it's Kali with, you know, a, a sword in one hand and a skull in the other. Yeah, Karma can simply like... We're, we're used to so much suffering. We're used to a strong level of it that it's sad. We can't actually perceive what a healthier version of reality is that we have to mock it like it's some sort of spiritual bypassing utopia. Mm, yeah. And that says nothing actually about what's happening. What's happening is going to happen no matter what. It's just that if a person chooses to view these things from such a mocking and far away manner. That's only talking about their view. That's not actually reflecting anything about the reality of, hey, enlightenment can still be stable form of reality and you'll still experience karma within that level of unity consciousness. Because karma is simply at that point, the contrast of the brush, right? The, the, the black and the white, Karma at that level doesn't need to be the way that we perceive karma mm. right now as something super violent. Yeah. It 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 can it it's something that at that point can be the waves at which we 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 surf. Yeah. Ooh. So from that sense, uh, I think one of the things we can do to reach there is stop mocking utopias, but also stop making them sound like 
we can't embody that in a way where there's still drama, but it's not going to be the intensity of the drama that we're used to. Mm. Amen. Yeah. It's well said. <laughs> That's very well said. Um, yeah. I don't even know what to say. Uh, I don't even know what to say to that. Yeah, it just gives me hope. If you even want to call it hope, it's just like a true hope for a better world. Being able to see that. I think that's what we're doing here. Creating some kind of better world. I ideally, I, I mean. Do you see that? Do you think we actually are creating a better world? Like that's what's going on here? Um, and if so, do you have a time frame? Like do you know this utopian mindset? <laughs> it might be oversimplification, but do you know when when this utopia will come about and I guess you could say more people will be enlightened? Sure, but when you say utopia, do you mean like perfect? Because when I think uh -huh. of utopia at this point, I'm not viewing it from there. I'm simply viewing it as like a golden age. Yeah. Well, there's no such thing as perfection. So, yeah. So, how the trajectory we're on right now is a lot like um, that phrase. Stop me if you've heard this one before. Mm -hmm. We're playing. It, it's it, there's something there. There's something very um, repetitious, yeah. like how I see what we're accessing is one that looks like the the Dwapa Yuga, uh -huh. one where cataclysm has to come in. Yeah, and there's just the people who had a high enough multidimensional vibration to align with having that play out, having that reality of there being a catastrophic disaster, mm. but yet without it affecting them to such a severe degree. Mm. That doesn't have to happen. That's why I don't make energy updates about that yet. <laughs> yeah. But that's what, I, that's what I see happening because there's just so much misalignment going on. Yeah. And that can only that can only increase so much karma that can only continue for so long until something in there shows that stronger manifestation to that attractor field. Because at that point, when it's that much actions being admitted from that plane of consciousness, it becomes an attractor field. And you can have strong attractor fields or you could have weak ones. And when I'm talking about an attractor field, I'll never mention that term attractor field, if I'm mentioning something small. Mm. I personally only use that term attractor field if it's big enough to be called an attractor field at all. I don't mm. throw around that world mm -hmm. word. So if you can you can only be feeding patterns that play into a collective attractor field for so long until you're gonna get that manifestation. Wow. Yeah. So so it's playing out a, a lot like Steiner said, go figure, but also before him, it's it's looks like so far it's playing out a lot like just what I said earlier, the yuga the yuga cycle. Mm. Mm -hmm. Where where there has to be some sort of finality, uh some sort of some sort of finality that comes in for the next age. Rather than what what could, what's a possibility, which is the the undoing of the karma. Yeah, I get. And you. then consciously selecting something else. Usually, what? Ha yeah, that that's that would be at this point the utopic thought, but that's just me. Mm. Now, if there are, there's something in me that I feel that, but there's something in me that's like. If there are different timelines, right? I could see it as this going into the next age, this other timeline. It's sort of like up to your choosing, up to all of our choosing. It's like, do we want to, do you want to be on the timeline of cataclysm? Or do you want to be on the timeline of um, not cataclysm, you could say, like, 
that actual brighter age. Um, is that the difference between this so-called 3D reality or 4D or 5D reality? It's it's sort of like, is it sort of like subjective in a way? Like you choose which timeline you want to go down, but in a way it appears as objective. Do you know what I'm getting at here? Totally. So some people in mysticism have depicted it as absolutely the opposite of that. And mm -hmm. then we have some people in this age who depict it as completely individual, meaning mm -hmm. you're always hopping onto whatever version of Earth already exists individually. And then, like I said, on the other hand, you have people that say, like, hell, you can. You can't do nothing. You're all bound together. <laughs> I do not believe that simply because I have my own gnosis about what's going on. And that's yeah. not true. Mm -hmm. But on that spectrum, what I see is that there is large collective timelines, right? So in our personal everyday life, we have what's considered individual timelines. And we can shift individual timelines. And we often do a lot. Yeah. Yep. But then for those larger timelines, that's when people feel like super heavy deja vu. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's when the Mandela effect starts playing out. Mm -hmm. Do you see how that's more of like groups of people rather than super individual pick your adventure? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I tune into. And that that's how I see it. And I can actually back that up with saying Mandela effects. Mm. Some mm. people go, wait a second. No, reality was like this. And they're not just individual. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that one person can't do a whole collective timeline shift. You know, one person might be like, no, I swear. I remember it this way. And they might be alone. Mm. Th that could happen. But typically, it does not happen that way. Typically, it happens with aggregates of people or at least pockets of people. I don't even see it as pockets. I see... I see things at the Mandela effect level as like 50-50 split. Those are large percentages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what did I talk about earlier? The timeline split, that sounds almost 50-50. And I'm not saying that's how it play out, but how there's like two trajectories going in opposite directions. Yeah. I see that. I feel that. It's like not everybody's going to make it. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, so there is one part of me, it's like, oh, we're building a better Earth, we're building heaven on Earth, as I said before, but then there's another part of me, it's like, well, not everybody's going to be there. It's like you have to choose that within, find the kingdom of heaven within first, and then the kingdom of heaven comes without, but it's like, not everyone's going to make it, and I'm pretty sure that's been in previous biblical literature, you know, the, what was the, uh, the 144,000 in the Bible that ascend, it's that idea. It's like not everybody's really going to make it. I don't know if it's that exact number, but it seems like if we are building a better world, it's like some are going to have to stay behind in uh, earth school for a little bit longer. Yeah, and what we have to see is that it's not a, a, it's a false dichotomy to look at it like left behind. Left behind is, I know you didn't say that, so I'm not saying this about you, mm -hmm. but this is a large thought in the collective. A large thought in the collective is that this concept means that people are being left behind. That's a false dichotomy. That's, a, that's not the correct way of seeing something. Left behind is almost like there was a parent and a child, and the child was abandoned by the parent. Yeah. Instead, everything can only make sense through the Gnostic lens because the Gnostic lens or even the Hermetic lens, but the Gnostic lens is that there's an awakener that can help you self-remember that you're sovereign, self-remember that your source. And then you have brothers and sisters is what I call them, but you have guides. You have people that enter your life. And depending on the soul contract or depending on, you know, the lessons, the particular, a person's own free will can make them grow way more than what was even set within certain chapters of their life. And that's why a lot of 
my motivation is to help people access that free will. They're so stuck, even in the in, even in the beauty of the concept of soul contracts. Like like we're we're still viewing a lot of these concepts through a very limited paradigm, mm. and because of that, we're limiting our own growth. So within all of that, we have we have people just like you know like an ecosystem to help us to that next level, and so seeing things from the lens of like some will be left behind and some will be able to progress it's almost like play stupid games you win stupid prizes is a better way of looking at it all <laughs> yeah i get that mm -hmm. like like the universe will mirror you yeah if you're like, there's no such thing. Some mystics believe, you know, so, some mystics believe that we're in nations. So, some people are in nations. Nations means like a very innocent state of not knowing. But we're, we're in the age of knowledge. We're in the age of information. And we're even moving out of that into, you know, its progression. We're not in the age of nations. And we're, we're in the age. It's willful ignorance at this point. Mm. No, nobody is being left behind in the sense that if a person is trying, the universe matches them in the resource in, in their next step, designs it for them. Yeah. So so from that sense, yeah, it's we're yeah, we're we're choosing whether we know it or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whether we know it or not is always the choice. Yeah. Hmm yeah that makes a lot of sense oh wow so it's like even people that don't believe there's free will they're using their free will to give up the idea of free will yeah <laughs> and the universe doesn't care that they think that yeah it, oh, they wow. don't get you know their their own build your adventure of not honoring that Mm. They just get karma. That's why karma is an impersonal force. Mm -hmm. It's not like anyone should be talking about karma in an authoritative state. Yeah. Yeah. When a person speaks about karma, they need to come from the most not like most impersonal state, not at, like karma's on their side ever. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. So when I talk about karma, I'm talking about it, it only for the means of clarifying things. Yeah. Yeah. I like to look at it through the lens of we reap what we sow. Everything yes. we reap, we sow. Yeah. The good, the bad, the ugly. Everything is through the lens of we have free will and using your free will, whatever happens in your life is because of every choice that was made pretty much always at every single choice every, anything that happens to you or for you is because you wanted it to happen it came from your will you could say like some kind of like it came from within first as, as within so without i don't know about wanted but i understand the gist of what you're saying it's something that's echoing us back to our actions our deeds regardless of uh, of ourselves yeah mm, yeah yeah as in like yeah like as in wanted as in we might not have wanted the um effect of it but we had a want that yielded the effect well in esotericism they even say that the reason why we have karma is is very good it's because we descended so far into matter that we wouldn't be able to get out without the force of karma. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, that's a very unique way to look at it. Interesting. Yeah, karma needed to come in at a certain point because when you're at a higher <laughs> level of consciousness and you're not like this deep in matter, this deep in spiritual amnesia, you could actually, you we could call it a responsible God. You could actually not have to worry about karma. 
But karma came in as a necessary force to help give us an evolutionary pathway out of matter. Interesting. Wow. It's like a rebound effect. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, because yeah. the popular ideal from Eastern philosophy is that we have to sort of escape karma as in we don't we have to not build karma anymore which i guess that kind of actually is the truth as well but yeah. one needs to work through the said karma in order to reach a state of karma lessness yeah and we're burning out that karma when we're burning out that karma that we wouldn't truly have it burnt out if we weren't reaping the fruits of what that would be. And what we would be is an evolved version of ourselves, an awakened version of ourselves. Yeah, jeez, this is good. And even the lower timeline, the one that I was talking about how the spiritual community sometimes looks at it as the one that's being left behind, even though that's not the correct paradigm to perceive this through. Mm -hmm. One could just look at that timeline as having karma amplified even stronger and that being its own purification process yeah mm -hmm. so we could look at all of this through the lens of like those who are having their karma burned out or those who are not mm. yep wow rather than oh my god some people are leaving us and we're left behind yeah okay yeah. I, I really i really hear ridiculous things said by some people that want to feel like they're in like an evolved state, like I won't leave them. Be and it's like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's no different than sensational theatrics just with spiritual wardrobe and words on. It's, it's, it's not evolved. Mm. It might appear, it, saying that might sound, make them have like a five minute rush of feeling good about themselves, but mm. it's really baseless and tacky. Yeah, I understand. Mm. I feel like that is the last attachment. The last thing we have to reap is the, the karmic identity. I'm sorry, the spiritual identity, you know, the spiritual ego, per se, to be the holy person. Well, a person who wants to like come from a spiritually awakened place to help a person would already understand in the first place that they can't do something for another person. Yep. And then yep. they would have to come from the acceptance of unconditional love, true unconditional love, which is I can help as much as I can help. But when I go into control, now I become a part of the problem. Mm. And mm -hmm. then I lose. I fall. Yep. Which is why another way of depicting the lower timeline is just victim consciousness. Mm -hmm. Victims perpetrating victims. Just vicious cycle. Mm. Yeah, we save ourselves to save the world. Yeah. Wow. Okay, this is good. Yeah, only we can do it, right? There's only so much that someone can do for somebody else. Ultimately, somebody has to partake on this path, the spiritual path, you could call it, with their own earnest will like nobody's gonna come and save you there's definitely helpful guidance right like you you're definitely a helpful guide but your door has to be open in order to receive the guidance right there's like there's really at the end of the day you don't need anybody else right on this path and i'm one way you could say you might need guidance at a certain stage i understand that but really at the end of the day, if it's all about you coming back to you, then you really don't need anybody else to save yourself. Like it's really all up to you to untangle the knots of your own karma through your own free will. Well, the more spiritually sovereign a person becomes, the more mature they become. The more mature they become, the more they see everything as a colleague. Mm-hmm. Our, our spirit guides are still respected, but they're colleagues. We don't have a child. Our higher self, our concept of God, source, whatever you want to call universal consciousness, all of these concepts 
are still respected and revered, but we're colleagues. We're not in such a parental child relationship. Yeah. And that's actually the true relationship. That's that's the that's our true relation to our higher self. Mm. And so um with that comes the um like back to Zarathustra. He he regarded Arumazda, which is like the Zoastrian. The Zo Zoastrian esoterica was the prototype for Gnosticism. And then Gnosticism from there turned into so, so many different threads, like Hermeticism, all these different things. And so original teachings got obscured and lost. And so um, what Zarathustra wrote about the prototype for what we have as religion and spiritual systems, he viewed what we're calling God or source as friend. And when you're in correct relationship with your higher power, he called that friendship. Mm. Friendship. That's what I call in my own teachings. I see it uh, as colleagues, but the, there's the same essence of one being being wise enough to know, to revere and respect and to understand your place and relationship without without taking on the spiritual amnesia of not knowing your true self. So you have those that help you with awakening that self-remembrance, which is why I keep coming back to saying self-remembrance. Others can help you awaken. But in the higher picture of what I was saying about friendship, can they do something for you? No, that's where religion obscured everything and made there a savior figure that you have to go through. Mm -hmm. And that was to produce more samsara and turn this into an energy farm, harvesting consciousness through its forgetfulness, through its amnesia. But friendship is, is 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 healthy. It's it's okay if people help us remember. Yeah. Yeah, the idea of friendship makes it so nobody is better than anybody. We're all on the same path. We're all equal. There is no hierarchy. I mean, you could say there is if there's a higher self in a different dimension. I guess you could see it like that. But there's just no... interdependence. Yeah. Yeah, it's a better way to put it. Interdependence. And, and that's how, you know, even, even Sunyata Dharma. What we find is that even the gods really loved to revere their avatars and, and likewise. So there's there's beauty in in having the the relationship. Mm -hmm. Of the differences rather than making that mean something, uh, you know, dominating or subordinate mm -hmm. yeah mm. i'd even call it poetry mm -hmm. yeah how so how would you relate that to poetry because you're admiring yourself in your higher self yeah mm. that's like how all poets you got to do one bit one bit giving praise to the moon <laughs> mm-hmm mm. Yeah, I see. Well, like we said, life is poetry. If you could see everything as the poetry, then I guess that is, uh, you're in the right path. Everything, you could say, brings one back home to oneself. If you can see the guru and everything, the teacher and everything, um, I would say you're on the right path. And that is the essence of this whole thing, is to be able to uh, see everything as divine, man. Even the shit, even the darkness. Like, see everything as essentially yourself. <laughs> right essentially everything is just you reflecting back to you it might not seem like it sometimes but it's true i am you and you are me all is one and one is all that is the highest of the highest truth i feel it's like all is one you know one love we've all heard it before but i think that is the essence of this whole thing what does the poem mean what is the meaning and the symbolism in the poetry it's for you to remember that you are the infinity you are the eternity you are it man you're it we're all it 
Um, so if you can see that in all of this, in this podcast, and when you're doing dishes, even in the dark moments, I guess that is the path for all of us. Would you say that is the essence of this whole thing? Sure. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're it. We're all it. Um, that's the beauty of it. <laughs> is that you are it. Wow. This is a wonderful conversation. Life is a poem. <laughs> yeah. Well, I thank you for coming on here, Sarah. I think this is an awesome talk. We got some good flow. We definitely dove deep straight away. Um, I don't really have anything else to say other than that. Do you have uh, any last words, anything you want to get off your chest for the pod before we start to wrap this up? Well, thank you for having me on. Um, I, I think we had a great conversation and that we unraveled a lot of gnosis. Yeah, we definitely did. I appreciate your time, effort, and wisdom. Seriously, and keep doing your thing. I wish you all the best. Um, and that's it. Peace and love to you. And peace and love to the listener. And uh, that's it. I'll see you Thank later. You. <laughs> Goodbye.